Dr. Dobre Kumui. You are welcome, sir. Thank you. Everybody praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. The Lord give you an explosion of miracles tonight in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. And we thank you for the great expectation of your people here and all over the world. We're asking, Lord, as we read your word, hear your promise, touch your power, we pray. Miracle will happen in every life. Miracle of salvation, of healing, of deliverance, of total supernatural freedom in every life tonight in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight, we come once again to reveal another aspect of the supernatural freedom. Tonight, I'm talking to you on the full price page for our all-round freedom. Freedom all-round in every area of our lives, all round freedom and Christ, Christ the Savior, Christ the Lord, Christ the Healer, Christ the Deliverer, Christ the Redeemer. He came to this world and he came to pay the price for your salvation, for your deliverance, the price for your redemption. And we're told in First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 18, for as much as she know that she was not redeemed, but chased with corruptible things as silver and gold, but from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers. From our fathers, grandfathers, great great grandfathers, all the way back to Adam. Because he and Eve gave birth to the rest of the world. They fell. They got into bondage. Oppression came. Sickness came. When they were created, there was no sin. There was, there was no sickness. There was no sin. Therefore, there was no pain. There was no sin. Therefore, there was no satanic affliction. Sin came in. And sin drew all those consequences. And we were actually in bondage to sin. In bondage to sickness. In bondage to Satan. And... To be free, we need someone to come and pay the price for our guilt, for our condemnation. And he paid the price, the total price. And he did everything there is to be done, everything expected by the Heavenly Father. And because of that, he has now paid the full price for our freedom all round. Freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from sickness, freedom from Satan, freedom from condemnation, freedom from corruption, and freedom from all the consequences of our evil. Look at verse 19. In verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. As I've said tonight, we're looking at the full price for our all round freedom. I'm talking about you. The full price for your all round freedom. Make it 
personal. After me say the full price. Page for my all round freedom. There's nothing disturbing your freedom tonight. You're free in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at before we pray. Number one, the great price of redemption from the ancient furnace. Ancient furnace, the furnace of affliction and the furnace of condemnation and the furnace of the manifestation of the evil power of the devil ancient as old as Adam and then it went through all over the world in every race in every country in every generation that ancient furnace in which we have been suffering tonight your freedom has come the great price of redemption from the ancient furnace. Number two, the godly passion in repentance towards assured forgiveness. When God reveals to us that we have offended him, it's like the person you love and the person who loves you so much and is the source of all revenue in your life is responsible for everything good in your life. And all of a sudden, you look at his face and he frowns. And you say, I sense something has gone wrong. He said, you have offended me. And you caught the court of fellowship. And you separate yourself from me and what you have done is like a dagger in my heart that brings the passion of sorrow the shame the sorrow and the feeling you have within you and in sorrow in passion you you crumble on your knees and you repent and you say I am so sorry to wound a loving heart like yours. That's repentance. Many people don't understand repentance. They are dancing. I'm repenting. That's no repentance. They are smiling. I'm repenting. That's no repentance. You put a dagger in the heart of love of the almighty God. And you said, see what you've done. Heaven is sorrowful. God is sorrowful, and the Lord Jesus is sorrowful, and the angels hang their head because mortal man has offended God, and he put a dagger in the heart of the love of God. You're sorrowful. You have the godly sorrow, the godly passion in repentance towards a short forgiveness. Number three, in the guided path. To recovery through active faith. The Lord guides you, says, Yes, I love you still. And I want your sins all forgiven. That's why I said the Lord Jesus Christ, my only begotten Son, to pay the price and to die for you and to bring you back into fellowship and relationship with. The Almighty God, the guided path to recovery through active faith. Look at number one. Number one, the great price of redemption from the ancient furnace. Look at the price. We're looking at Psalm 49, reading from verse 7. It says, none of them can by any means redeem his brother. None, no king, none, no emperor, none, no man, none, no religious founder, none, and there's no denominational head, none, there is no man, there is no woman on earth, any generation that can redeem its brother, no give to God a ransom for him. Nobody could have paid the price. And because of that, God looked at all of heaven. 
not even angel, Gabriel, Michael, any other angel, any angel in heaven could pay the price. And of course, on earth, Adam, the first sinner, Eve, they could not pay the price. Cain, Abel, Enoch, all the people that ever lived, none could pay the price. Only one, only one, the only begotten Son of God in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he came, because nobody could pay the price for your freedom from the ancient furnace. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, For the redemption of their soul is precious. So deep, so great, so precious, that no one could pay for it. And it ceases forever. But now, God seen us in that furnace. Furnace of affliction. And you know, furnace had different grades and categories. There was the Egyptian furnace. There was the Babylonian furnace. And everything going on, even the same furnace has gradual or graded heat. In a time of Nebuchadnezzar, it said, I want that furnace heated seven times more. And so you understand, when we're talking about furnace, furnace, higher, furnace, higher, furnace, higher, there is earthly furnace, there is eternal furnace, the fire that never goes out. And nobody could redeem anyone from the everlasting eternal furnace. But one, 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 the Lord Jesus Christ who died, who shed his blood, who paid the price for your redemption and for your freedom. That's why the time you have the opportunity to be saved, to be taken out of the earthly furnace, of the eternal furnace, of the permanent, perpetual, everlasting furnace, the time you have the chance to say, yes, Lord, my heart, my mind, my soul, rest up to you. I want to be saved. And good enough, I come on the basis not of my works that cannot pay the price. I come not on the basis of what I've done religiously that cannot pay the price. I come only on the merit of Jesus Christ, your perfect only begotten son. He died on the cross and you have heard his said at the final time before he went from earth to heaven, it is finished. And because it is finished, tonight it will save you. It will deliver you. Out of that ancient furnace, it will set you free tonight in Jesus' name. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 20. So you understand that this is coming directly from the word of God. It says, but the Lord has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace. The Lord has taken you and he has brought you forth out of of the iron furnace. How did he do that? By the lamb that was killed. The lamb representing Christ. Until Christ came. Behold the lamb of God. And when I see the blood. I will pass over you. The blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. Not silver or gold. Not the works of man, not the efforts of man, not turning over a new leaf, only the blood of the Lamb took them and brought them out 
of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance as she are this day. As she are this day. When you come out of that ancient furnace, then you belong to the Lord and you will not be in captivity anymore in Jesus' name. I look at um, uh, Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 4. In Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 4, it says, Which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. From the iron furnace. It was that ancient furnace. Egypt was an ancient country, ancient nation, and they had that ancient furnace and they were to be tormented they tormented the people they put them to rigor and they made them to suffer and it's just the ugly representation of the eternal furnace awaiting every man and every woman and that eternal furnace will torment the soul will torment the spirit, will torment the body. And those who have gone there, we heard from one of them, when he said, I am tormented in this flame. I am tormented in this furnace. I'm tormented in the eternal, forever burning lake of fire that burns to sulfur and uh, burns with fire and brimstone and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and they had no rest day nor night anyone that refuses to be brought out now and to be redeemed and to be saved Therefore, for the sake of your own soul, you want to come out of the earthly furnace now and also in preparation and readiness that you will not get into the eternal furnace of punishment for the people who live and die in sin, in evil, who live their lives rejecting the prize and the only one that can bring them out of the furnace. And the Lord said, I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice. Was his voice repaired? So that sin will not be your ruin. Was his voice repaired? So that you can come out of the earthly furnace and you can be redeemed and preserved and taken away from the gauge of the eternal furnace will be my voice and do them according to all which I command you so shall ye be my people and I will be your God. God lives in heaven. When you are saved, when you accept the prize that takes us out of the ancient furnace, then you come to be a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God, and you live with God forever and ever in heaven. If you don't, if you reject the prize, if you reject the Christ, if you reject the Savior, if you reject the opportunity of being taken away and being forgiven of your sin, then you'll go to the other side forever and ever. And that is the everlasting eternal furnace. Once somebody gets there, he cannot come out, cannot say, now I realized my mistake when I was on earth. I didn't respond to the price that was paid for me, and I lived carelessly. Somebody told me, an evangelist told me, a preacher told me, but I thought it was idle tale. Therefore, I didn't accept. Now I'm ready. Uh-uh. It's forever gone. Once a man die, it says there is this a final verdict. A man dies and he has rejected salvation until his death. 
is forever sealed but today is the day the opportunity you have to say I will seek the Lord while he may be found I will call upon him while it's near I return I turn away from my wickedness and from my foolish thoughts and I return unto the Lord and then he pardons you he will abundantly pardon we're looking at Isaiah chapter 48 and I'm reading from verse 10. I say, chapter 48, verse 10. It says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have reformed you, and the price is not the price of silver. All the money in the world, all the money in all the banks of the world, cannot redeem your soul. That's why Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? If you were to have all the money in all the banks of the world, it will not redeem your soul. It will not set you free. If you were to be so prosperous that you are, your wealth is greater than the wealth of the whole of your continent, not only of your country, if you were to be so wealthy as to have all the wealth of your continent, all that still will not redeem your soul because it says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not or silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. He took us out. He brought us out. He redeemed us from the furnace of affliction. And it's good we listen to him because he is the only one that determines the price of our redemption, the price of our freedom. And he wants to set us free from the ancient furnace. Tonight, the opportunity is yours. It will set you free. It will take you out out of that iron furnace, out of that ancient furnace, and by implication, out of the eternal furnace, awaiting the people that reject the prize of the Almighty God. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, it says, Oh, that thou art hearkened to my commandments, then at thy peace being as a river and a righteousness at the waves of the sea. When you listen to the Lord and he says the path of sin leads to affliction and leads to the furnace. The path of transgression leads to earthly and eternal furnace. The path of sinfulness leads to burning and burning forever in hell fire. The way of the transgressor is hard. The affliction is unbearable. And then he said, oh, that they are hacking unto my commandments. Then at their peace being as a river and thy righteousness are the waves of the sea and the peace of God will reign forever and ever in your heart, in your life, in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the godly passion in repentance towards assured forgiveness. Assured forgiveness. What do you think? How do you see that? Affliction has been there. And now the only one that can remove the affliction, he says, come, come, and I will set you free. And let's say, for example, like, you know, when we were very young, uh, you took a piece of uh, meat from the pot, and you were chewing that. And uh, your mother then comes in, and almost begins to cry. I didn't, I didn't know I have a thief for a child. Your mother almost begins to, you know, fall down to say, what is this in my life? I never knew I had a thief 
for a daughter and then as we're chewing the meat and uh, you say hey, mommy I am sorry I am sorry and you kept on chewing the meat and while mommy was almost in tears you put even in her presence now you put your hand in a pot again uh, and took another piece of meat that I'm sorry I'm sorry has no meaning because what your mother is crying about and what your mother is trying to correct and what your mother is sorrowful about you repeat it in her presence when we sin it brings sorrow in the heart of God when we sin it brings sorrow in the heart of Christ who was nailed to the cross who died for us when we sin we nail him again it's like we're crucifying him again and he's sorrowful the sin that you commit the lie that you tell the deception they just throw out glibly it offends the Lord the adultery, the fornication the drunkenness and the smoking of whether ordinary cigarettes or marijuana or whatever it pains the Lord and when you go into occultism into dark evil powers and you join your life a life created by God you take that from from God and you throw it to the hands of the devil and you are in covenant with the devil the enemy of God it pays God to the very heart and then God comes to you and he says I sent my evangelist to you I sent my servant to you to get you out of that scene and then the evangelist preaches the preacher declares the word of God and he says the Lord says repent and then you smile and say yes I want to repent that's not repentance and then you go back after the evening meeting the same cult and the same gang that God says this is an offense to heaven. You go back again to that cult and to that gang. That offense the Lord more. If you're going to repent, what it means is you realize the deadliness of sin. You realize the evil in the thing that you have done. And repentance means it shocks your heart. It pains your heart that you have gone astray and you turn and you're passionate about it. You're sorrowful about it. And you say, Lord, I was foolish. I, it was terrible. I couldn't think of anyone more stupid than I was that I could have done that against your heart of love. Your heart is broken. And then you surrender unto the Lord. Look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 10. It says, for godly sorrow worketh repentance. Not godly laughter. And it's not frivolity. And it's not, you know, amatease. I don't know the consequence of the sin I've committed and I just come. Oh Lord, they told her to raise up her hands. I'm raising up my hands. Are you there, God? Okay, forgive me. Forgiveness does not come that way. It says, for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. The sorrow of the world when you lost a car you were so sorrowful that it almost gave you hypertension you are so sorrowful you couldn't eat you couldn't drink you almost killed yourself the sorrow of the world when you lost a job you almost died and you say how am i going to live now no joy no happiness no laughter you lost a job when you lost a pregnancy you almost collapsed how could i lose that the sorrow of the world what a death but now you lose your soul and you are smiling 
You lose the love of God and you are smiling. And you lose the fellowship with God and you are smiling. To you, ignorant man, ignorant woman, the card that you lost is greater than the loss of your soul. The pregnancy that you lost is greater than the loss of your eternal soul. If you were sorrowful by losing something on earth, you must be terribly sorrowful because you lose your interaction and fellowship with God. That's why it says, for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, repented of, regretted of, that's what it means, and but the sorrow of the world walketh death and as you come to the lord and you say lord now i realize this is a serious matter i don't want to die in my sin and go to the eternal furnace i come to you now have mercy on me and forgive me the lord will forgive you in jesus name but if while your mother is looking at you and you're chewing the meat you stole, you put your hand in the pot again and, you know, put another one in your mouth, your mother will not take your plea for forgiveness serious. The same thing with God. If while you're saying, God, forgive me, God, forgive me, I have done what I shouldn't have done. I have not done what I should have done. Forgive me, forgive me. And after the church service, forgive me, I have done what I shouldn't have done. You go back to the same thing again. The Lord does not count such people serious, and God does not waste his time or waste his love upon the people that want to keep on sinning, sinning, sinning and saying, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. He counts them serious. They want forgiveness. They want salvation when they are sorrowful for their sin and they turn away and they say never will I allow anything to get me back to that dungeon again and the Lord will have mercy on you look at second peter there chapter three i'm reading from verse nine second peter chapter three we're looking at verse nine it says the lord is not slack concerning his promise that christ is coming back that the world is going to end and that the world will go up in fire and that God is going to make a new earth and a new heaven. The Lord is no slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but his long suffering toward us. Not willing that any should perish. If Christ had come last week, where would you be today? If you have not been saved, you'll be forever lost. That's why he's waiting. He said, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait for another night. I'll wait for that boy. I'll wait for that girl. I'll wait for that man. I'll wait for that woman. It's not slack. Christ could have come, but because of you, he says, I'll wait. Tonight, I'll give him another chance. Tonight, I'll give her another chance. Because he is not willing that any shall perish, but that all shall come to repentance. And I see he's calling upon you today again, and he's saying, now, seriously, now, in a sober way, now, wholeheartedly, Come out of your sin and come to the Savior tonight. You will respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at Luke chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 8. Luke chapter 3, we're reading from verse 8. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance look at the boy i was talking about that took that meat out of the porch and mother came in and said what's that in your mouth and the child became so sorry and so sorrowful 
and you know put the meat out of his mouth touch the enjoyment of the stolen meat and then will not touch any other thing and knelt down and said mommy that's the last time Give me another chance. Forgive me this one. I'm sorry I was so foolish. I'm sorry I yielded to temptation. I will do that no more. That is the fruit of repentance. When you have come to the Lord and you have said, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. I went the evil way. I went the wrong way. I went there in the night. And I did nothing in the night. I went that under cover of darkness. And I did that foolish thing under cover of darkness. I did that thinking nobody will ever see. But I can see that you up there, you see everything down below here, truly, honestly, wholeheartedly, from the death of my heart, I turn, I repent. That is the passion the godly feeling, the godly pain he wants you to have because of what you've done. And it is when you don't go that direction again. That is the fruit of repentance. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. You know, Abraham called that fellow in hell. He said, son. He called him son. Physically, naturally, a Jew called him son. But he was still there. And a Abraham could not help, could not get him out. Once somebody gets there, forever, forever, the fellow is lost. And don't begin to say, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these tools to raise up children unto Abraham. He has the power to convert the people that have stony hearts and make them tender children of Abraham. He has the power to convert the people that have the stony heart of unbelief and give them the trusting heart of faith. God has power to turn all these tools. He has the power to turn the stubborn mind and turn that into a saved soul as you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, here I am. I want your salvation. And I want it so deeply and so honestly that I turn away from all the evil in my hand. God is able. God is able. He will do it today. In your life, he'll do it today. It will turn your mind against evil. It will turn your decision away from Satan and turn you to the Savior. And then you become a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a child of God. And God says, I will dwell in them. And you also, you'll abide with him. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, and now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that bring which bringeth forth good fruit, which bringeth forth not